Welcome everyone to another episode of Jack's Live. I'm your host, Jenny Morganwick, and joining us today from our Sacramento location, I'm, I'm in Bar Harbor, Maine, um, is Dr. Kyle Dreheim, who is a scientist with our Department of Innovation and Product Development. So welcome today. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for joining us. Um, so today we're going to get a preview of the immun immunology uh, research that you've been doing. But before we begin, I have a couple housekeeping notes for our audience. So just want to let you guys know, uh, be sure to use the comment box on whichever platform you're joining us on today. Ask us a question, leave us a comment, let us know where you're tuning in from. I like to hear where everybody's tuning in from. Um, give us a shout out. Um, and, you know, if you do want to drop us a question, we'll do our best to get the questions peppered throughout the interview today. And we do have a question and answer session towards the end of the interview. But if we don't get to your question, we'll be sure to follow up offline. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, so the first question I have is, can you tell us a little bit more about your research? Yeah, sure. So um, a large focus of my department is to try to develop the best in vivo platforms for immune oncology or IO so that they can be used in the wider research com community for drug development. Um, when developing an in vivo model, there are two aspects that you really need to consider. Um, one is, does the drug work? And two, is it toxic for the, the patient. There's a lot of relatively new cancer drugs um, that work by activating the patient's own immune system against the cancer cells. So in order to develop a platform to test this class of drugs, you need to have both a human immune system together with human cancer cells. So a recent study that I worked on looked at taking the NSG MHC class one, two double knockout mice and grafting them with human tumor cells and human PBMCs or the immune cells um, and putting them together to then test drugs. Um, we used this particular mouse model to look at both efficacy of these IO drugs in addition to their toxicity, specifically in regards to cytokine release syndrome or CRS. So the, the recent study that you mentioned, I know that you were going to present that as a poster, right, at the yes. um, ASCO, the American Society for Clinical Oncology meeting, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and yes, I know that yeah, was the right. spring, and, and unfortunately it got canceled. Um, but, and, and I think that what they did was they allowed you to kind of post the poster, but- Yeah, we uploaded the poster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I know that Jax is going to be hosting uh, scientific sessions on immunology, um, and that is Monday, July twentieth at eleven yep. a.m. Um, Eastern. Yes, and, and I will Eastern. be there sending my data there. Okay, great. And you're going to do it in like a PowerPoint format or a presentation? Yeah, a PowerPoint, and I'll have all of the data that's in the poster, and actually then some because it's a a more comprehensive format. Oh, that's, that's great. So you still get to show everyone the results of the study. But that's awesome. Um, so you mentioned CRS, so the cytokine release syndrome, and mm -hmm. we did have a previous live stream uh, where we discussed that. And it's such a big component of all the work that you guys are doing. Can you just catch up, um, catch our listeners up on exactly what CRS is? Yeah. So cytokine release syndrome is a type of inflammatory response that affects the whole body. Um, it can be triggered by a variety of different factors, um, such as large scale infections or certain drugs. Um, it basically happens when you have a large number of your white blood cells and they become activate and they become activated, um, then they release these inflammatory cytokines or, or signals. Um, these cytokines then in turn activate even more white blood cells, which produces a higher response and so on and so forth. So CRS is also an adverse effect of some of the monoclonal antibody medications, um, including a lot of those used for immune oncology therapies. So, um, I know that the animal models are very important, you know, very depending important. on what you want to study, mm -hmm. uh, you have to choose the right model. And you did mention that you were using um, the NSG MHC class one, two double knockout, which yep. I know is an NSG variant from our, our portfolio here at Jax. Why did you choose that model for these studies? So we knew that we had to use at least one of the NSG variants because we needed a strain that lacked an immune system. Otherwise, it 
the mouse would reject the human cancer cells and the human immune cells that we were trying to engraft in. Um, however, since we were also putting in human immune cells, um, when you do that into a mouse, um, the human immune cells will start to attack the mouse tissues once they become fully engrafted in the mouse. So this means that you have a fairly narrow window in which to evaluate the drug efficacy or the drug toxicity. Um, using the MHC class one to double knockout mice, um, those mice eliminated or those mice have um, the key proteins that are necessary for the human immune cells to target the mouse cells, those proteins are eliminated. So this gives you a much longer time frame in which to run the studies. So in the basic NSG mouse or some of the other variants, you have to choose between either running an experiment to look at efficacy or running an experiment to look at toxicity or CRS. Using this class one, two double knockout variant, we're able to look at both of these within the same in vivo subject in the same experiment. That's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. In so in your latest studies, um, you know, going back to the to the CRS topic, what are some variables that might have affected CRS? And we actually have um, a question that's coming in from the audience who was asking specifically about the PBMC engraftment levels and how they affect CRS. So that's an excellent question, and we get that all the time. Um, there are a number of factors that will affect the the CRS response um, or the the extent of the response. So one is indeed the PBMC engraftment levels. So the more immune cells you have that can become activated, the the more cytokines you're going to see and the worse the response you're going to see. Um, not surprisingly, another factor that influences the CRS response is the dosage of the drug that you use. So in general, the more drug that the, you use, the greater the toxic response that you will see. Um, we've also screened PBMCs from multiple different donors, um, and we can see a very specific donor dependency. So some donors have a very moderate CRS response, and some have a very high CRS response. Um, another thing that we have found is, is that the target for the drugs involved. So frequently the whatever antigen you're looking at in the tumor cell, um, so the the level of that also impacts the, the CRS response. So if you have a lot of this antigen uh, on the tumor cells, you're gonna have a bigger response than if it's only moderately expressed on the cancer cells. So that's interesting, the fact, you know, going back to the, the statement that you made about how you screened a bunch of different donors mm -hmm. and saw different responses. I mean, you know, that leads, it, it gives it gives the population an uh, explanation as to why some people might yep. develop a reaction to something, whereas others don't. And others won't, and yeah. And that's great that you guys have been able to screen, um, you know, how, how many donors do you guys generally look at or, or what's what's your I mean what's your basically what's what, what's the numbers that you guys can work with I mean how many donors are we talking as many as the company can provide us um, okay. so uh, for any given model we screen um, on the upward scale of 30 to 50 different donors wow. um, uh, and and that's when we're using basically the same cancer cells and then just looking at a multitude of different donors. And then you also have the same donor with a multitude of different cancer cells and every combination is unique. Um, and it really shows how personalized medicine is really important um, because you, you can't find a rule that fits everybody. It really depends on both the immune system and the cancer. That's that's interesting. Um, so I did want to take a second. I, I love getting the shout outs to see where people are, are tuning in from. Um, we've got San Diego. We've got Massachusetts. We've got India. We've got France. I love when we get the international audiences tuning in. So uh, welcome, everyone. And remember, if you have a question, feel free to pop it in the, the comment section and let us know. We've got a couple in right now. So we'll um, we'll get to some of those. Um, let's see. So. Um, one question I have here, which I think is great when people can kind of take what you're talking about and apply it to something more mm -hmm. general. And, um, someone's asking, 
can this type of technique, study, things like that, be applied to the broader topic of immunotherapeutics? And I, I think they probably are getting this because of the whole CRS conversation. Yeah, in, in yeah. The so, so absolutely. Any therapeutics that either suppress or activate the immune system needs to be evaluated to see if it causes CRS because it all has the potential to. Um, and this is especially if the mechanism of action is using um, some sort of manipulation of the receptors on the white blood cells. So this can include drugs that are used to prevent organ rejection um, for, for uh, tissue transfers, or even drugs that are used to modulate immune autoimmune disorders. So, so potentially this could be used in tandem with looking at models of like lupus or psoriasis, yes. which we do have a couple of those um, platforms um, up and running at JAX. Mm -hmm. And, and it's great to kind of bring in the idea of organ donation, because I know that one of the biggest problems with being an organ donor recipient is not so much um, rejecting the organ that you get, but having to take all those medications to yeah. suppress your immune system over time, that's what can really, um, you know, hurt your whole body. So it's, right. it's great right. to see that there's now um, these platforms that can kind of, you know, look at drugs to make that stuff a little bit better. Yeah. To, to help those, those people. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you? What's next for the research that you're doing and, and, you know, in immune oncology and in general, what have you gotten on your plate? <laughs> so our ultimate goal is to try to make it so that we know before a patient is treated, whether the drug that they're going to use is going to work and if the drug does work, is it gonna make the patient have this toxic response or have this CRS response? Um, there's two ways that this platform can help with that. One is if we can develop the model, we're, we're actually pretty close, but if we can develop the platform such that we can take the patient's own cancer cells and their own immune cells, put it together in a mouse and then test the various drug combinations and, and read out both the efficacy and toxicity before giving that combination to the parent, patient. So that's one way that this platform can help. Alternatively, um, we can use this model to screen all those different cancer and um, patient immune cell combinations to see if we can look at the genetics behind uh, what causes these responses so that we can ultimately get to the point where we don't even need the mouse model. We can just look at the genetics of, again, both the cancer as well as the patient's immune cells and be able to accurately predict if the drugs are going to work. And if so, if are the drugs going to, to have a toxic effect on the patient? Oh, that's fascinating. It sounds like you've got a lot of work to keep you busy. We have our work <laughs> cut out for us. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions. We do have a couple questions um, pertaining to some more nitty gritty stuff about your study. So I'm going to say uh, we'll connect with those people offline. Make sure that um, that if you're interested in, in the poster that um, that Kyle is going to present that you turn into the immunology um, scientific sessions. So um, it looks like we're winding down here. Um, Unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you, Kyle, so much for joining us today. Thank I know you, you guys so are for having super me. busy out there. So anytime mm -hmm. you can take a couple minutes away from your busy schedule to talk to us, we really appreciate it. Um, so if we didn't get to your questions, we'll follow up uh, with you individually. Again, join us on Monday, July 20th for our immunology scientific sessions. And we will see you at the next Jack Live. Thank you.